International Conference on Thinking. Lots and lots of things to talk about. And uh, when I was a little kid, I had severe autism. No one, uh, speech middle age four. And then you got a lot of other kids that are getting labeled with uh, milder autism, usually no speech delay. And uh, I've worked in the uh, livestock industry for over 40 years. And I've worked with lots of kind of quirky, different people that were brilliant at what they did that today, would probably be diagnosed on the autism spectrum. Now, I've always liked to do a variety of things. It's really a, pleased to be here today for your conference. Uh, last week, we were doing um, animal welfare auditor training. Then I'm doing an autism conference. And then I'm doing the book tour with my new book, Calling All Minds, which is about getting kids just inventing things, getting them doing things with their hands. Uh, I got interested in science from a very young age. My grandfather was an inventor. This is his patent for the very early um, autopilot sensing device for airplanes. And I used to ask him endless science questions. Why is the grass green? Why is the sky blue? And then we done, he worked for years in a loft in this building, and he couldn't figure out why they couldn't get it to work. And there was another man he worked with named Andrew Nickian, who thought up an idea for how to make an autopilot work. And my grandfather says, yes, I can make that work. And they had trouble getting it to work. And they finally realized that their workshop was uh, located over where they fixed trains. And the big metal trains underneath their workshop was causing a problem. They had to get it away from the trains. Sometimes there's something simple. And then he explained to me how things like tide gates worked. We've got to get children doing real things. Yeah, screens are OK, but they also need to do real stuff. And this was a study that showed that children like real things better than pretend things. And I went to a nursery school in kindergarten, Northwest Missouri State University, that uses an Italian educational model. And they get the five-year-olds using tools and making robots out of broken computer parts. One big mistake that some schools in the, in the US have made is they've taken out hands-on things, like drawing. And in my book, Calling All Minds, I start with the simple projects, paper snowflakes, drawing with compasses, because we have um, students today in college that do not know how to use a ruler. Also having some students whose writing skills are not very good because their work hasn't been copy edited. But we've got to get kids back doing hands-on things. This is one of my drawings for a large livestock handling facility. Now, when you are weird, the way you sell yourself is to show your work. So I always had portfolios of work where I could show people my drawings. This is the drawing right here that I sent to Cargill in the late 80s to sell Cargill, huge beef corporation, on my design services. Now another important thing is you have to touch to perceive. I've been in the meat industry for 40, over 40 years, so I watched the switch going from hand drafting and doing all design work by hand to computer drafting. And I noticed a very odd, disturbing thing that happened during the switch, and it may still be happening now. We started to get drawings with weird perceptual errors. For example, the center of the circle was not in the center of the circle. People were not seeing their drawings. And I got them from all the major meat companies. This would have been all through the 90s. And when I investigated who drew the drawing, it was somebody who took the course on computer drafting at a, at a community college, but they had never built anything, anything, and they had never drawn by hand. All of these drawings, these bad mistakes on them, were done by people that had never touched either drawing things or building things. You 
know, it's so much more fun to go down to Cape Kennedy and see a real launch. And I had a chance to visit Cape Kennedy. Boy, that was such a fun experience. I got to see a real SpaceX launch. I also got to tour the Mars launch platform. And the person who worked on this had Tourette syndrome. I was invited to Cape Kennedy with the disabilities people. Well, let me tell you, I want to see all the space stuff. And the thing is, as I walked underneath that to see it, and it had a great big sign that said, the future starts here, I thought, okay, if you have Tourette's, what would you rather be? Mr. Mars launch pad or Mr. Tourette's? I am seeing too many kids becoming their label. Autism is an important part of who I am. With the college professor, equipment designer, animal behavior specialist, that comes first. That's my identity first. And I worked with so many skilled trades people, brilliant people working in steel, where they took a welding class in high school, and now they own a big company that does metal fabrication. Uh, this is what disturbs me as I go back and forth between different, um, the autism world, the cattle world, and the educational world. I want to see these kids be successful. And taking hands-on classes out of the schools is one of the worst things that's happened. And one of my favorite um, hobbies when I was in high school was model rockets. And we had to make our rockets. You had to make them. You didn't buy them. Engines you bought, that's a safety issue. But the rest of the rocket, you make yourself. And there's the SpaceX launch on taking off. And when I was a child, I would tinker for hours with my aviation experiments. Parachutes, bird kites, those are in my new book. And the thing, that I, the thing is, is that I had to experiment because it did not work. A lot of kids today don't spend enough time just tinkering with things to figure out how to make it work. So as a grown-up, when we were working on Calling All Minds, I go back and recreate my childhood experiments. It was not easy. I was not able to buy exactly the same materials. And I used a rough surface art paper, which was not readily available. So the kids are going to have to tinker to get it to work. Surfaces matter in aviation. Now you notice the ends of the wings are bent up, just like modern jet airplanes. I invented that before Boeing or some of the other aircraft companies invented that. But they didn't know about that. Another fun thing that kids can do is looking up patents. So I started to investigate rough surfaces to put in the book. So I looked up golf balls. And it was an accidental discovery when, when golf first started that a ball that was all beat up and scarred flew further than a smooth ball. That's aerodynamics, You're getting back to rough surfaces. I could not get the same materials. Kids are going to have to experiment. I substitute file folder, which is easy to get, but smooth. They may have to tape some roughness onto it. Now there's the real airplane with a little winglet. That's the original design. You just bend up the wing. And kids can experiment with this. And the patents for these are fun to look at. They're patents so simple that children can understand them because they are simply shapes. Well, some airliners have um, a little double one like that. And then some just, you know, they call that the blended. You see, engineers have tinkered with all sorts of things. And there's a patent for a, winged, a winglet, and you can see it's simply a shape. And then there's something really weird like this. Uh, only one airplane got that. It was experimental. That's like kind of crazy. And now the latest one, I call this the little girl with the curl. This new Airbus, it goes like this. Now another thing looking at this, you might wonder, why is the back of the engine shaped like this? It makes it quieter. And the patent is a shape. You can look up Boeing's patent. It's in my book. It's a shape. And so I got to thinking, I wonder if rough golf balls with dimples are quieter when they fly than smooth ones. Turns out they are. I actually found a weird paper on that. Another project I had was making an optical illusion room. My science teacher did not want to tell me how to do it. This project is also in Calling All Minds. Unfortunately, we couldn't get it here because um, it didn't get published until May 15th. 
Um, but my science teacher wanted me to figure out how to do it. He wasn't going to tell me how to do it. You see, a lot of kids today are afraid to make mistakes. Well, I made a lot of mistakes. I also found out that this HBO stagehands had trouble building this. They made a life-size one. Our illustrator had trouble with it. My science teacher gave me one hint. He showed me a picture that showed this shape for about five seconds. Only hint he gave me. We've got to keep these classes in the schools. They foster creativity, art, sewing, cooking, playing musical instruments, woodworking, theater, welding, auto shop, creative writing. These are really, really important classes. And the other thing is every single one of these classes can introduce a student to a career that will not be replaced by computers. People are still going to want to go to live theater. The other thing is, I get asked, how did I get interested in the cattle industry? I got interested in it because when I was a teenager, I was exposed to it. It's important for students to try different things. Find out what you love. Also find out if you hate something. That's also equally important. I talked to a flight attendant yesterday, a really nice flight attendant, and she said she studied nursing, and she found out she hated it. And she loves being a flight attendant. And she got introduced to that through a friend. Okay, I've observed a lot of grandparents coming up to me at autism meetings, people 50 and older, and they're finding out that they probably had dyslexia, or they were autistic, or they were Asperger's. And they figure this out when the grandchild is diagnosed. But grandfather's had a good job all his life. And he's had a good job because at 11 he was selling newspapers. He was learning work skills young. I'm seeing a lot of problems with a lot of kids today becoming their label, getting overprotected, and not learning how to work, not learning shopping, and other basic skills. They're getting babied. Now, I'm a visual thinker, so I don't see the label. I see the kid. I saw a boy just the other day. He was about this tall. And I go, oh, I think Google might like to hire you. And now I'm seeing pictures in my mind from Google when the same kind of boy is this tall. He's 25 years old, and he works for Google. <laughs> now let's look at things like autism. Brain variability. A brain can be more thinking, or a brain can be more social-emotional. Now a certain amount of this is just normal personality variation. People with technical careers have a lot more relatives with autism. People in creative careers, a lot more people with bipolar, depression, and some of these disorders. See, within certain limits, it's just variation. This is a fascinating paper, 2018 paper, Genomic Traders, are autism and schizophrenia the steep price for a human brain? Because the same genes that make a big brain also are involved with autism and schizophrenia. You can't get rid of the genetics. It's part of what makes a big brain. And the scientists said the same genes that make us human also are going to give you autism and schizophrenia. I want to ask, what would happen to some top innovators today if they were in today's educational system? Would they have been less successful? How about Steve Jobs, bullied in school? He was a weird loner that brought snakes to his elementary school and turned them loose just to see what would happen. Uh, he was an artist. That's one of the reasons why iPhones and other smartphones are easy to use. He would have been a special ed kid today. How about Albert Einstein? No speech until age three? Yeah definitely would be a special ed kid. Now Jane Goodall, she did her famous work and all she had was a two-year secretarial degree. That's what she had. Could she have done that today? I just met, a, I just talked to a guy who's 75 years old that can make anything out of stainless steel, owns a great big factory, and I talked to him about where he would be in today's educational system. He says, I would have had every label they ever would have been. But he did enough hands-on things as a child, 
and he started out just cleaning dairy processing equipment, and then he goes, oh, I can figure out how this works when I take it apart. So he learned engineering from that. I'm seeing too many kids getting labeled autistic, dyslexic, ADHD, and I'm worried about them getting screened out. Another problem is they changed the autism diagnosis in 2013 so that the very severe that never get speech and the child where there's no speech delay and he's just basically a geek or a nerd are all put together. And I'm seeing worse problems with not learning shopping, bank account, and other basic skills. And when I suggested to one mother that her child should um, uh, buy some office supplies, she started to break down and cry. She said she couldn't let go. Well, that's kind of getting them, uh, you know, so overprotected, he's not going to learn anything. And there's dyslexic people that have been very successful running major businesses. JetBlue, one of the few airlines in the U.S. for the back of the plane, has good light room. Um, IKEA, you all know about their bookcases that are impossible to put together. <laughs> he had both ADHD and dyslexia. Thomas Edison was labeled a hyperactive, addled high school dropout. He also realized you have to work hard to invent things. He said it's 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. And he had to try many, many different filaments until he found one where, it, where the light bulb would not burn out right away. So there's lots of mistakes and being uh, really tenacious and persistent. Uh, he'd be right into special ed today. Common denominators of unique minds. Growing up with lots of books. That was definitely me. Early exposure to things that could become a career interest. Cattle, that, I was exposed to that as a teenager. But when I was eight years old, my ability in art was always encouraged. And I was encouraged to draw lots and lots of different things. I also learned to work. My mother had me in a sewing job when I was 13. And when I was 15, I basically ran our school's horse barn after being thrown out of ninth grade for fighting with girls who bullied me. And the only place I was not bullied was where there was a special interest. Friends who shared interests, horseback riding, model rockets, and electronics. So I made a model rocket that looked like our principal. The Kelly kids thought that was really funny. Those are my favorite books when I was little famous inventor book, and Black Beauty. I also love The Wizard of Oz, Eloise, and Curious George. Now, arts foster success. I found this paper. A Nobel Prize winner was 50% more likely to have an arts and craft hobby compared to other scientists. Hobbies such as painting, music, art, many, many different kinds of hobbies. Now, this is one of my most important slides. Now, I know that Howard Gardner has been here and talked about the different, you know, different ways of thinking. And we need to be taking the thing that the kid is good at and build on it. We also have to be thinking about what can he finally do when he grows up. We're not thinking enough about outcome. Uh, in my work on designing livestock equipment, I would sell a job, I would draw up the drawings, supervise the construction, start it up and make it work. And when you're involved in construction, it's about outcomes. I want students going out there and having good careers. Now, the first two types of thinking on this slide are completely supported by neurological brain research. And some of this is a little bit different than Howard Gardner, and some of it is exactly the same. And everything I think about is a photorealistic picture. Okay, I'm thinking about the delayed flight yesterday. I'm now seeing the airport. So I tend to bring up a real recent memory or a much more distant memory. But it comes up as specific photorealistic pictures. And the researchers call that an object visualizer. Couldn't do algebra. Couldn't do algebra because there's nothing to visualize. Kids that have problems with algebra need to go straight to geometry. Just skip the algebra. I am not going to be a chemist. That's not my thing. And in designing things, I'm on the industrial design side. There's two parts of engineering. There's industrial design, and then there's more mathematical part. 
Then you have the pattern thing. This is a spatial visualizer. They think patterns. And there's actual brain research. It's in my autistic brain book, and that is here, to support these two types of visual spatial thinking. Photorealistic object visualizer and a pattern spatial visualizer. Think origami, organic chemistry. Uh, these kids sometimes have trouble with reading. See, again, kids with labels have uneven skills. And I just talked to one mom, and her boy was having trouble with reading. You've got to check out problems with flickering lights. Some of the LED lights flicker. Maybe get the kid an office with, or a classroom with a window. Get natural light in there. Sometimes putting the homework on different pastel papers can help. Then you have the guy that knows everything verbal. Total verbal thinker. Everything about baseball, everything about movie stars, or some other subject that he's interested in. And these guys are often not good at drawing. Where the photorealistic and the pattern thinker, they'll love Legos and drawing and a lot of those kind of things. A lot of the math minds really into music because that's patterns. And then you have the person who's an auditory thinker. They're going to be good at sales. They like to talk. They're into language. And this is, uh, these, you have these slides, if you want to copy them, go ahead and do that. Now, 10 years ago, I got to do some really fun things. I got to um, get a brain scan that showed that I had a huge visual thinking circuit. Whenever I get a chance to travel into inner space, I like to do that. And my visual thinking circuit there is bigger than the control. And that's just another version of it right there. Great big visual thinking circuit. Now, what's blue on this slide is full of water, basically. And you can see on my scan, there's an asymm asymmetry that really wrecked working memory, trashed out the algebra department. So what happens when there's brain differences is one part might get an advantage and another part loses. I talked earlier about the autism and schizophrenia, the price for having a big brain. In autism, there's an early overgrowth which gives you circuits in the back. Music, art, math, but then you lose circuits up for the social, up here in the front for the social. Schizophrenia, what happens there is, is just not enough circuits grow, but it all goes back to brain development genes. So a kid that's got working memory issues, if he has a task that requires a sequence, give him a pilot's checklist. Step one, step two, step three, to just cue him one to three keywords uh, for each step of some process. This is what Thomas Edison had to say about mathematicians. I can always hire some mathematicians. They can't hire me. <laughs> and there's my book, The Autistic Brain, where I provide scientific evidence, uh, both brain scan evidence and uh, uh, psychological, you know, educational testing evidence. And this book will have it for sale at the break. A shameless book promoter. <laughs> also, I'm pretty sure it's available in Spanish. We've got quite a few books available in Spanish. I'm worried that our educational system is screening out visual thinkers. We need them. In the last month, I've been in two really super nice hotels where the city had water problems, where the city water supply broke at what, the Sheridan in Pittsburgh. We had no water the Sheridan in Pittsburgh. That's happened really recently. We need visual thinkers to prevent serious accidents such as the Fukushima nuclear reactor meltdown. You see, a visual thinker, when you're assessing risk, sees risk. The mathematician tries to calculate it. I can't design a nuclear reactor, but all I need to know is that when I need the electrically operated emergency cooling pump, when I need it, it has to work. Or you're in a lot of, you have a meltdown. And they had put the electrically operated pump in a non waterproof basement. Not a good idea when you live next to the sea. Watertight doors would have saved it. And what I've learned about the mathematical mind is they don't see the water going in there. I'm going, huh, oh, I can see that. We need visual thinkers in science. There's been problems in science with biomedical experiments in things such as cancer. Uh, one researcher does it, another researcher does it, and you come out with different results. And in one case, 
One researcher shot his cells. The, the cells shot them really hard. And another one just did this. So the way they stirred their samples totally changed the results. So when I review journal articles, I go over the methods. I'll leave it to somebody else to do the statistics. But the method sections, many papers, are really, really bad. And that's, I call them out. Well, what breed of animal did you use? How did you house them? Tell me what you did. And there's Grace Hopper, early computer programmer. Uh, she was a brilliant person. And uh, she absolutely was horrible at Latin. Again, the uneven skills. Now, Stephen Hawking is definitely a pattern thinker. And oftentimes, educators insist that children show their math work, how they did their math. Stephen Hawking did all his math, and these are his famous equations, in his head. He couldn't write. Everything was done in his head. What a lot of teachers don't understand is that these pattern thinkers think differently. And he used a type of mathematics called Penrose tiling. This is the fun thing to look at online. You want to find really cool stuff for mathematical education, use the image function on Google and look up trigonometry, geometry, solid geometry, fractals. Look up all of these mathematical things. You will find wonderful web pages that you won't find just searching on the regular Google. And one of the things that Stephen Hawking said is, concentrate on the things your disability doesn't prevent you from doing well. And math in his head was something that he could do really well. And here's uh, Stephen Hawking having a really fun time in a plane that does a roller coaster in the sky. It's basically a converted jet liner. They go like this and you get weightless. He says because he could no longer write down equations, theories had to be translated into geometry in his head. And he used geometrical math that was easier for him to visualize. Another interesting thing I learned less than two years ago is that artificial intelligence in computers thinks the same way I do. It's bottom-up thinking. Verbal thinkers get a hypothesis. We have this grand new theory of education. It's going to fix everything. It doesn't. Bottom-up thinkers use specific examples to form concepts. So people tell me that I'm much less autistic now than I was uh, even you know, 10 years ago. That's because I've put more and more data into the database. You see, you've got to get these kids out and fill the database. That's how bottom-up thinking works. And what I've been reading about artificial intelligence, it's both interesting and it's also scary. But concepts are formed from specific examples. When I was a young child, I sorted horses, cattle, and dogs by size. So I mean, I'm pointing out cats, dogs, and horses, not cattle. Cats, dogs, and horses by size. Well, that worked really well until our neighbors got a dachshund. And I had to figure out why a dachshund, since it was the same size as a cat, was not a cat. So I had to find sensory-based features that dachshunds share with dogs. Barking, nose shape, and smell. It's not word-based thinking. It's picture thinking. Now, the more different kinds of dogs that I see, I can then start sorting them into smaller and smaller categories. I can also find out that uh, something can be in more than one category. Let's just take objects. Something could be rectangular, but it could also be red. So it might be able to be in two categories. Top-down thinkers overgeneralize. Very bad problem in education. Also, all of my thinking is sensory-based. It's not word-based. You know, people say, oh, you have this or that, and I go, yeah, but those words basically mean the same thing. And here is a phone app that can diagnose melanoma. I'm looking, watching really carefully the professions that might get taken over by computers, dermatology, oncology, radiology. I wouldn't be bothered. Skilled trades, art teacher, drama, music. They had a very nice live, uh, uh, live uh, xylophone and uh, musical instrument uh, playing in the lobby with real people. People are still going to want those things. That stuff's not going to get replaced by computers. Radiology, forget it. Don't be bothered. Don't 
spent 10 years studying that. The ultimate bottom-up thinking. This is a computer program for diagnosing cancer and figuring out the treatment you should have. And the CEO of this biomedical company said, we are not making any hypothesis up front. We're using patient-derived data to generate the hypothesis. I'm going, wow, that is exactly how I think. So the computer scientists have basically built the autistic brain. And these systems get better as they learn. And I was just reading it, some of them either can do some kind of creative pattern bot. There's a system now that's very good at playing this game Go. It's like a very complicated form of chess. And it came up with a radically new kind of move that actually worked. Now, being a visual thinker helped me with animals. Because it was obvious to me to look at what are cattle seeing when they go through the shoots. Now, when I first started working on this research in my 20s, I thought everybody was a visual thinker. I did not know that my thinking was different. So it was obvious to me to look at what are the cattle seeing. Why do they stop here? There's a coat on the fence, a reflection off a vehicle, a shadow. Now I'm seeing a picture from North Carolina State University's horse clinic, and there's a big metal drain on the floor, and they were telling me how the horses refused to walk across that, so they tore part of, part of it out and made it concrete. You see, that's something specific. And I would pay attention to visual details that other people just weren't seeing. How many people know what this is in this picture? Okay, we got a few people that have seen eclipse shadows. This is in front of our library at Colorado State University, and trees were making these sh eclipse-shaped shadows because the leaves of the trees act as pinhole cameras. I noticed these shadows. Other students walked over them. I did not know that trees could make these kinds of shadows. But I discovered this on my own, and everybody else was walking over the top of it. So I noticed that things like chains would scare cattle. Why, after more than 40 years, I still have to talk to people about, about distractions, chains hanging down in shoots, because they're not seeing them. Or maybe a little yellow tape that scares them. I also get asked all the time, since I work on slaughter plants, do the cattle know they're getting slaughtered? And they're more afraid of that tape. I've been in two factories where a paper towel just blowing like this was stopping. A paper towel. That's all it was. Took away the paper towels, then the cattle started moving. Non-slip flooring is essential, working with animals. Animals panic when they start slipping, whether it's cattle or whether it's your dog at the vet clinic. Then give your dog a non-slip surface to stand on. Now, I want you to raise your hand if you noticed that that animal was looking at the sunbeam. Uh, we're doing uh, so so. I just showed the same slide to little elementary school kids. Half the hands went up. Kids see it. Where I find with a lot of grown ups, I have to really push you to observe where he's stopping. He's looking right at it. Now you look at this and you go, yeah, he's looking right at it. It should be obvious. But it's not. And animal memories are specific because they're sensory based. An animal remembers a picture, like maybe a veterinarian in a white coat is scary, takes off the white coat, then it's fine. I knew a horse who was terrified of black cowboy hats, but he was abused by somebody with a black cowboy hat. That's in my book, Animals in Translation. And a white hat was fine. Or different sounds. He hears one vehicle comes running because they're going to be fed. The cat hears the can opener. They know they're going to be fed. That's sensory based. Another vehicle might mean trouble. They're going to chase us into the corrals. Top down thinkers over generalize. Verbal thinkers over generalize. And this is a huge problem when we're trying to figure out an educational program for a kid with differences. They'll just say, how do I handle autistic kids in the classroom? That's too generalized. If the child is three or two and not talking, I can give you a, a general uh, uh, talk on early intervention. 
But once they get older, I have to know a lot more. Age? Can he talk? What is his problem at school? Is it bullying? Does he have trouble with reading? Does he have trouble with a noise? Because you can have sensory problems with autism and other disorders. And sometimes you can reduce the noise sensitivity by giving the child control. Let's take a vacuum cleaner. Let the child turn that vacuum cleaner on and off. Where he controls it or she controls it, that often makes it easier to tolerate. Or if they're wearing headphones, encourage them not to wear the headphones. You've got them there when you need them. They can be with you, but try not to wear them. Again, giving them control. Early exposure to career interests, riding horses, working cattle, learning carpentry. I had a wonderful animal behavior class when I was in college. That was another thing that influenced me. And I was a lousy student except for biology and writing. I had some excellent teachers. Wonderful speech teacher when I was young and my mother always pushing me to do new things. My third grade teacher when I was eight, marvelous. And then my science teacher. And my science teacher got me interested in science by giving me interesting projects to do. You see, now education became a way to the goal of becoming a scientist. So then I studied. Where before that, there was no reason for study. Why study? And I'm very concerned that a lot of smart kids are getting addicted to video games. And they're ending up in the basement playing video games. Kids also have to learn how to work. It's a different skill than academic skills. I want that to start when they're like 13, 11 years old. If there's a paper route, a paper route, maybe working at the local store, maybe a church volunteer job, walking dogs for people, where they're doing tasks on a schedule outside the home. But when you're weird, you have to impress your customers by showing off your work. Here's another one of my drawings. People thought I was really weird, but I'd take out a big drawing and show it to them. Now it would be on my phone. And I learned always have the portfolio with you because you never know who can open the door. So what I'm going to tell you is students need to work hard, but they also need to learn to recognize the door. There is a scene in the HBO movie where I go up and I get the editor's card. And that's how I got the in to start writing for our state farm magazine. Then I got into a big trade show with a $500 uh, registration fee, and I got the editor's card for the national magazine. So you gotta work hard, but you also have to see the door. And there's my brochure. I made sure I had a very professional looking brochure. The reason it's not in color is in the 70s and the 80s, color printing cost a fortune. It had to be run through the press four times. Uh, so I made something really attractive on nice textured paper in one color printing. And there's my original project I built in 1974 that I designed. And another picture of it there. And there's the one they made for the movie. I really like the fact that the movie showed my projects. Because what's made life worth living for me is having interesting things to do. It improves treatment of animals right now, but I also want to see these kids that are different, you know, be successful in life. I started my career building things, or rather supervising building things. And the thing that I've learned from working with construction, it's all about outcomes. It affects how I think. There's an urgency in construction. If you don't have parts, we would pick the phone up, there was no internet, and call and call and call until you got the parts. Now it would be search and search on our phones looking for parts. But it's the same thing. And I'm seeing too many parents where they might have a kid that should be getting a job and they say, we're thinking about it. And I said, in construction, you have to do it. And I'm realizing how much it affects how I think. You got to get it done. I'll never forget the day that the contractor that I worked with blocked a big main street with a cement truck. And he says, I just did it. And if the police come around and ask them to direct the traffic, now, obviously you can't do that every day, but you've got to get it done. Now, how do different kinds of minds work on big projects like a large meat plant or some other very large factory? The visual thinkers like me, we're in the drafting department. 
We lay out the whole entire project, lay out all the equipment. Then you got the quirky guys that work in the metalworking shop. We call those millwrights. And they're the ones who invent a lot of the really creative mechanical equipment. And I'm worried that in the US we're losing skills. Uh, in December, I went through two very large pork processing plants that were built in this country. And we don't make the specialized equipment anymore. It's made in other countries. And I think the reason for that is, is taking skilled trades out of the high schools. Because some of the people that I worked with that were really brilliant, that welding class in high school is what got them into the, into the skilled trade. We don't make it. We've got kids with a label still playing with Legos when they're 16 years old, and they've never been introduced to tools. You know, and skilled trade shops are not going away. Don't stick your nose up at them, people. You buy that condo in that big fancy tower building and the water doesn't work. Uh, that's not going to be very much fun. You're not going to want to live there. Now you take your engineers, the more mathematically inclined ones with formal degrees. They'll do the boilers, the refrigeration, uh, calculate the substation load for the power supply for the plant, do soil compaction, roof trusses, design pre-stressed concrete walls. So you need to have the whole team to put together this great big factory. And it doesn't matter what industry it is. These principles go across all the industries. And there's a completed one of my center track restrainer systems. Don't worry, I'm not going to show you any slaughter pictures. Basically here, I want to show off the metal work. Because I show these slides to a lot of parents and teachers. And if you want to see how this system works, you can look up my beef plant video tour with Temple Grand, and you can watch it on that. Well, I call that one there heavy metal. And you look at that and you go, well, stupid people can't build something like that. Get a little respect for it, people. Next time you go buy a construction job, maybe you better stop and look. And then always I would show people things uh, designed, finished uh, products. Uh, this picture actually was in the portfolio of stuff that I sent to the head of Cargill in the late 80s. There's another picture. When you're weird and you show off your work, what you basically want to do is have a 30 second wow. Something that that person can look at and go, wow, let's say it's coding. Don't give them a book this, the, you know, this two inches thick of, of stuff. You know, give them some samples of code where they can glance at that code and go, oh, wow, beautiful. It only took a tiny amount of memory. That's what you want that uh, job recruiter to see. But then on the other hand, the person has to learn to do the assigned work. You're going to have grunt work, even in the best jobs. One of the things I had to do at the magazine was to make lists of show and sale results really boring, but it's part of the job. And there's another picture of one of my projects. Now, half the cattle were handled in equipment I designed. And I get asked all the time, what was the thing you're most proud of? I'm proud of a lot of the things I designed, but the thing that actually made the biggest difference in improving animal welfare was an evaluation system that I made for assessing meat plants. And the problem that's made with a lot of evaluation systems is they get way too complicated. And, and so I looked at five uh, simple things. There's the center track restrainer, I'll show how that works. Um, I measured five simple things. Okay, we've got to make them dead, and uh, you don't make 95% of them dead, you're going to fail the McDonald's on it. It's clear. It's like traffic rules. It's really, really clear. A vocalization, mooing during handling, that's a really, they're doing something wrong. That score will shoot up. That was one I figured out when I was collecting data. But figuring out what to measure. Right now I'm on a scientific committee on guidelines for dogs on airplanes. So I started writing all this stuff. And I'm going, oh man, it's a complicated BS. I'm gonna just throw it out. Okay, we don't want someone bitten really badly on an airplane and we don't want a dog dying on an airplane. So I went through all the airplane web pages and I go, wait a minute. I want it so that the flight crew, everybody who touches that flight, gate agents, know this dog in the cargo hold. 
They've got to know it's there. Let's redo the computer system so they'll know it's there. Really simple. That might just solve a lot of the problems. And I throw out all the complicated rubbish I've written. Because if they register the dog 48 hours ahead of time on the corporate help desk, does the crew know about that? You know, nobody wants to have a, have a dog die on an airplane. I was on a flight one time and we were just ready to take off and the pilot comes on and says, they put a dog in the wrong baggage hold. It's not pressurized. He will die. We pulled off. They came out and switched the dog. A whole plane cheered. But the pilot had to know it was there. And dispatch called him. He says, dispatch called and said we had a dog in the wrong compartment. If that had been on the flight manifest, they would have known before they left the gate. Really lucky that dispatch called. So that might be the simplest thing is we get it into the computer system. Super, super simple. You know, I found in designing things, you got to think simple. Now in 1996, I took baseline data for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The plants were really horrible in the 80s and 90s. They were terrible. Busted equipment. And then, got big restaurant companies evaluating things. Things got a whole lot better. But we've got to make sure we go after the right stuff. There's a tendency to just want to go over all the paperwork. Well, I don't care how many records you have, they don't know the dog is in the cargo hold when something goes wrong, or there's a big snowstorm, or they leave it on a hot runway in Phoenix. They don't know it's there. First thing they got to do is know it's there. Okay, really, really simple. Got to think simple. So I chucked out all my rubbish that I was writing yesterday, and we just got to make sure that everybody knows it's there. It's that simple. I can write that on one little page. When I learned how my visual thinking was different from verbal thinking, it gave me insight into how different people's brains approach problem solving. And this has been a gradual process. I'll never forget when I asked a speech therapist about a church steeple, and she says, pointy thing like this. I don't see pointy thing. What I see is specific, because my brain is digging down into the primary graphics files. We've got to make sure that educators don't screen out students with unique minds. And now, we have lunch, and that's a coffee break. Thank you all for coming.